A very good afternoon. I am Dr. Shaila, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, and I'll be the MC for today's program. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the last day of our international webinar on pharmaceutical chemistry and intellectual property rights. First and foremost, I would like to thank all the participants for retaining the same enthusiasm throughout the course of the webinar and showing a great deal of zeal and eagerness for this webinar. As the saying goes, unity is strength when there is teamwork and collaboration. Wonderful things can be achieved. As Confucius rightly pointed out, it does not matter how slowly we go as long as we do not stop, more so during the testing times of Corona. Let's begin today's program with the same strength and an everlasting positivity. We have with us today an eminent speaker, Dr. Nikhil Jiyar from Department of Medical Cell Biology, Uppsala University, Sweden. Before the session begins, I would like to shed some light on how you can communicate with us during the webinar. Any questions that you might have during the presentation can be posted on the chat box. Now, I request Dr. K. Nandini, Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, to introduce our respected speaker. It is with a special excitement that I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Nikhil Jia, Assistant Professor, funded by NNF Grant, Gothenburg and Oxford Universities, Oxford, for the first session. Sir got graduated from University of Mysore in the year 1994 and completed his master's in 1996 from the Department of Biochemistry, University of Mysore. Later, he was associate researcher in Molecular Connections Limited, Bangalore, and junior research fellow working with university grants with Mysore University. And uh, in 2009, he joined as project student in Umeya University. In the year 2015, he was awarded with his PhD from the Institute of Medical Cell Biology, Uppsala University from Uppsala and continued there as postdoctoral fellow funded by SSMF grant during 2016 and 17. He has numerous scientific publication to his credit in various reputed international journals, including Nature Communication, Journal of Cell Biology, eLife, eBiomedicine, and so on. In recognition of his scientific works, he has been honored with a number of awards and to name a few, Swedish Medicine Faculty Funding, European Foundation for Study of Diabetes, Lilly Fellowship, European Foundation for Study of Diabetes, Rising Star Award, and Swedish Strategic Foundation Collaborative Grant for Academia and Industry Collaboration for Diabetes Research, and so on. He has been invited as a resource person to several national and international conferences. Sir has guided several graduates, postgraduates for their degree. Currently, along with teaching, he is actively involved in research too. With this brief introduction, now without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Nikhil. We welcome you, sir, and request you to take over the session. Thank you very much for a very nice introduction. It was very overwhelming to listen to that. And uh, I thank you very much for that. And I also thank you very much for inviting me and uh, also organizing such a nice webinar. Let me try to present what I have here. So, so uh, I thought of putting up whatever I've worked with 
uh, in terms of diabetes and also introduce uh, stuff which is not explored in diabetes so that the students can get motivated. That was the idea of the talk. And I thought this was a nice place because you have students coming in and uh, the, the, the students are the future of uh, research so that, that they should be motivated in the end. That's what uh, was the idea of this talk. Uh, so I currently am uh, right now in Gothenburg. I'm not in Uppsala anymore. And uh, I'm going to speak more about subcellular view of type 2 diabetes and mode of action of anti-diabetic drugs. So if we look at the prevalence of uh, diabetes in India, so it was, uh, especially in the metropolitan cities, you see a very high prevalence, like 22, 17, 18 percent in Chennai, etc. And this prevalence is not only limited to metropolitan cities, it's also present in rural areas as well, but not at this level. Maybe. So the prevalence was around 5.8% when it was initially reported in 2000. And this prevalence has been increasing year on year. And you can see by 2015, it is already up to 8.7%. So there is a constant increase there. And if this rate of increase keeps on going, then there will be more than 134 million people suffering from diabetes by 2045, which was 74 million when this all started in 2017. India, along with China and USA, are one of the uh, chief countries with highest number of people suffering from diabetes. So something needs to be done. So I told you a lot about diabetes. What does diabetes affect? So diabetes affects multiple uh, parts of the body. So it's not a single disease, it's a syndrome where uh, the brain and the circulation also has its, uh, they have, they, where it is affected. And uh, you have also diabetic retinopathy, which affects the eyes. And also it can affect uh, the circulation and then cause stroke, etc. And then there's, there's also diabetic nephropathy where kidney is affected and then the blood pressure is affected. And there's diabetic foot when the foot gets swelled and there's probably possibility of amputation, et cetera. And there is also effects on uh, the peripheral nervous system, which, you, uh, which is called diabetic neuropathy, and there's also birth defects, et cetera. So there is many of these. But a lot of the research that is uh, focused on diabetes is usually focused on areas which are towards skeletal muscle, where the glucose uptake is reduced, or adipose tissue where there's insulin resistance, or the liver where the lipid production or the lipid utilization is blocked, or in the brain where there is uh, infrequent secretion and uh, there are different uh, effects also on the intestinal tract. That is where most of the research is focused on, especially in case of type 2 diabetes. But there is an, uh, also one part of it which is not focused much, which is the pancreas itself. Why is it so? That is what I'm going to say more. So to understand this, let's let just look at the pancreas. You probably know where the pancreas is. It is just below the, the, the it, is, it is along the duodenum papilla there. And then the pancreas is just below the gallbladder. And the pancreas itself is opens in, into the duodenal duct there. And uh, the pancreas has three parts of it. One is head, the other is body, and the tail. If you look more in detail or take a section of the pancreas, what you would see is that there are a lot of acenar cells, which are sort of light brown in here. And then in the middle, there are these islands of cells. These islands of cells are called islets of Langerhans. And these islets of Langerhans are comprised of a capillary network and also uh, three different types of cells. One is the beta cells, which are predominantly present, which are these purple color. And there's the green colored alpha cells and also delta cells. If you just look at uh, the tissue section and an image of the uh, pancreas section, what you would see is that you see a large number of uh, acenar cells which are present there. And in between there is this island, which is the islet, which is comprising of all these cells that I spoke about. So when you have a meal, what happens is there is an increase in blood glucose. So there is whenever there is blood glucose increase, this has to be metabolized. So uh, this, this metabolism happens through uh, secretion of insulin. And immediately when there is increase in blood glucose, 
the body senses this and releases insulin. So after breakfast, you will have very nice insulin secretion. After lunch, again, you have insulin secretion. And again, after a dinner, you have insulin secretion. This is a normal functioning of the body in response to blood glucose. So the insulin itself is secreted upon a meal in a biphasic manner. Initially, when you eat a meal, there is immediate secretion of insulin into the blood, which is, where is, the, which is called the first phase here. And then there is a slow culmination into second phase, which goes on for a very long time. So this whole metabolism of glucose takes around two hours. And there is this initial first phase and the slow second phase that develops, which, is, uh, which ensures that the glucose is metabolized. What happens in case of type 2 diabetes? In case of type 2 diabetes, there is no first phase or there is no second phase. Both of them are very much stunted, ensuring that there is no insulin response at all. So I'm telling you a lot about insulin. Where does the insulin come from? Insulin, I told you in the previous slide, comes from beta cells. So if you see an islet here, there are a large number of cells in the islet. These green cells are the beta cells in there. All these green cells can secrete insulin, which culminates into the biphasic response in the blood. So if we look at these individual beta cells, these individual beta cells have uh, cytosolic granules. So these are large dense core granules, which are present there. It is there in the cytosol as well as in the plasma membrane. These granules, they bud off from the Golgi, and they, when they bud off, the hormone insulin is put into these uh, granules. And these granules are the ones which fuse to release insulin. So the, 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 the presence of these granules is very important. So for the, I told you that there are cytosolic granules in the previous slide. So these cytosolic granules have to release insulin. For them to release insulin, they have to translocate from the cytosol to the plasma membrane, undergo a process called docking. So this cytosolic granules are sticking to the plasma membrane from inside the cell with a process of docking. And then they undergo several release-ready reactions, which are called priming. So where the, this, these granules get release-ready, where they are uh, recruiting a lot of other, other things, which make, makes it release-ready. And then upon a trigger, so this is regulated exocytosis, so calcium acts as a trigger here. And one, once the trigger is there, that is when the insulin is released from these granules outside the cell. And bear in mind that there are many different cells in an islet. And there are many islets in a pancreas. So all these culminate into the insulin response in the blood. So what we initially looked into was that there are around 9,000 granules in each beta cells. Only 100 of them secrete insulin. So we wanted to see how these granule pools, the ones which are there in the cytosol, the ones which are secreting later the plasma membrane, how do they relate to the biphasic response in the blood is what we wanted to look into. So that was one of the questions that we tried to address. The other is, how is this in the individual beta cells? How are these steps affected during type 2 diabetes? We also looked into what is the importance of the preparatory phases, which is called priming in this case, for the release to happen, and what drives calcium entry. So calcium entry is very important because when you, uh, you don't want insulin being secreted all the time. You want insulin to be secreted exactly at the time when you have a meal. So when you have a meal, there is uh, glucose which is metabolized, and then this ensures that there's action potential. This, and this action potential depolarizes the cell, ensuring the calcium entry, which acts as a trigger for the secretion to happen. So whenever there is no glucose, there is no trigger, so there are a lot of granules present. So how does this calcium entry, how is this calcium entry driven? That's one of the things that we asked. And how are they affected in case of type 2 diabetes? Is there any clinical relevance to these steps? Are there proteins involved? How are the expression of these proteins? How are they affected in type 2 diabetes? What that other, was the other question? So to address all these, we, we, we had to look at a very high resolution, the individual insulin granules which are present in the beta cells. To do this, you could, have, you could just take a normal microscope and uh, try to visualize it. The problem is it's very hard to just visualize all the granules because there is nucleus, there is other cytosolic com components in the cell and whatnot. So um, what we tried to do is we fluorescently tag 
the individual granules which is present here. And then even if you fluorescently tag, there are granules which are present in the cytosol and there are granules which are present in the membrane. So if you do an epifluorescence microscope, you would see all the granules which are in the cytosol and the membrane. So there will be no higher resolution to individually see granules which fuse to release its content at the plasma membrane. Even if you do confocal, you would be able to see different sections of the cell, but then it doesn't mean that the resolution would be there to see the action where the exocytosis of these insulin granules happen. So what we did is we used a method called turf microscopy. What is turf microscopy? So turf microscopy is a technique where you shine in light, the laser beam, uh, at a critical angle onto the surface of the cell. The cells are plated on a cover slip, and then you shine light on them. When you shine light, of the, uh, light on them, only the fluorescent tagged insulin granules, which are present at the plasma membrane, they shine. And that is acquired by a camera later. So this gives you a very high resolution of these individual granules. So in the turf uh, microscopy, what you would be able to see is you would be seeing live cells. Uh, you can see any live cells. For the, in this case, we take endocrine beta cells, and you would be able to see them in very high resolution. And you can see uh, like very small puncted structures uh, where in, in these live cells. So here you can see uh, insulin granules and a protein which is, which is present here, which is called syntaxin. I will speak a lot more about syntaxin much later, but this is just to show images of how it would look like. And if you look in confocal, then it would look more like you would have insulin granules. So you can see a nucleus there. So you can see this is the membrane then in the confocal, and you see granules like this, and then you see the proteins which are present there inside as well. So what we also try to do is we label these insulin granules and then we use turf microscopy as I told you before and we also can stimulate cells in the uh, in the culture or in the in the setup that we have. So we can stimulate it with glucose or we can stimulate it with drugs and whatnot and see what happens to these individual granules which are in there. So that is why it allows us to study these individual granules at a very high resolution. So when you look at a turf micrograph, you see all these dots which are present there. All these dots are individual insulin granules which are fluorescently tagged there. And when you stimulate this with glucose, for example, what happens is that you start to see a lot of granules which are moving around. And some of these granules, as you might be seeing now, they try to uh, brighten up and then they, try to, uh, they disappear completely. So if you see individual granules, it looks like this. They're present there and they brighten up because of the change in pH, because it's acidic inside these granules, and then they fuse to release their content. So this is one part of it, where the fusion to outside of the cell happens. But there is also the opposite of it, when there is a fusion, the individual granules in the cytosol should come to the plasma membrane. So that is through docking. I explained this before, where the translocation happens from the a cytosol to the plasma membrane, and that is visualized like this, where you have no granule present there, and you would see the granule coming up, and they start to settle down at the plasma membrane of the cell. So, when you stimulate these individual duct granules, uh, you you see you you see a few a fraction of duct granules which are present there. When you stimulate them, you see them disappear. Afterwards, these granules are not present at all. So there is this dog granules which disappear upon stimulation. So we tried to do this on many different donors that we received. So these individual donors has many cells into in each of them. And you can see that the density of these dog granules correlates very well with the insulin exocytosis that takes place. So there is exocytosis and density which correlates very well. And you can see these red dots here, which are uh, which are type 2 diabetic donors, and you see a decrease in granule density, which also means there is reduction in exocytosis in these uh, individual donors that you see. So in type 2 diabetes, we saw fewer dot granules like, across many donors that we saw, and this was independent of if we saw any non-diabetic donor at that point, it would be much higher. You can see fewer dot granules present in these type 2 diabetic donors. So to summarize this part, I would like to say that regulated exocytosis requires dock granules, exocytosis depletes dock granules, and type 2 diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetic individuals have decreased secretion due to limited availability of dock granules. 
But I'm telling you a lot about these duct granules, granules which come from the cytosol and duct to the membrane. So what is so special about this? To understand what is so special about these docking granules, you need to understand what's the mechanism behind it. So we go back again to a non-diabetic setting where the individual granules, uh, you can visualize them in these uh, high resolution microscope. And when they come to the plasma membrane, there should be some sort of a glue or something to stick there so that it is present there. So this should be some sort of a protein. From the neuronal secretion, which is very similar to this secretion, we know the snare protein called syntaxin, which is present uh, at the plasma membrane. So these also express in beta cells. And uh, these, these proteins, they, are, they have a transmembrane domain, which means that they are present all the time at the plasma membrane. So when these individual granules come, what you would see is that the individual granules are docking there. And within a few seconds, you see syntaxin being clustered at that place. It forms a microdomain, which is present there. And that's what the signal is, so where the granule is docking, and then there's a microdomain of syntaxin going up. And if you look into this movie, you would see that the syntaxin, which is in green, is trying to form a cluster there, where the granule is in red, and you sort of see them stick together so they can form a microdomain. So I told you that syntaxin clustering forms a microdomain and docking. So that's when the docking happens. There are several other proteins recruited, which we don't discuss about. But there are some proteins which are recruited much later. So they don't recruit during docking. So this is a docking here. And they were they're recruited not immediately after docking, but much later, which is like MUNG13, calcium channels, and etc. Uh, other proteins as well. So these are called priming proteins. So these make the granule primed in the, for that matter. So these are priming proteins. Calcium channels is one of them. This makes these granules release ready. What happens once, the, once these granules are release ready? So once these granules are release ready or primed, they fuse where the calcium is acting as a trigger. They fuse and release insulin. And this is what we visualized. When we visualize individual fusion events, what we see is that there is granule exocytosis, and all these proteins, which are part of the microdomain, they disappear, like syntaxin there disappears. Whereas for the granules which didn't fuse to the membrane, they don't disappear, they're present there all the time. What this shows is that these individual microdomains which are formed, they disappear after a while. So syntaxin clustering induces docking in the plasma membrane. HEVC domain of syntaxin is involved in docking. Among 13 calcium channels are involved in granule priming rather than docking. Priming, prime granules are the ones which undergo exercise. What happens if we go back again with this knowledge from the uh, non-diabetic donors, if we go back to the type twos, what happens there? So when we look at non-diabetic ones, you see a very nice association of these granules. So these are primed granules. They're very well associated with calcium channels. And when you look at type 2 diabetes, so this association of these granules with calcium channels is lost. So there is no association at all. So the, still the calcium channels are present at the plasma membrane, but they are not present at these microdomains where the granule is recruited or docked there. So these calcium channels are very important for the calcium influx to happen. So in this cell, you see the influx of calcium. The red ones are the spots where the cal calcium influx happens. And you see granules there, they sometimes coincide with these influx sites. So whenever there is insulin granule undergoing exocytosis, uh, just a few seconds before, there should be influx at that site to ensure that this exocytosis can happen. So in case of type 2 diabetes, what happens is that the channels are not associated with these granules, which means that the influx at the, which ensures that exocytosis happens is delayed with a few seconds. Actually, this is just delayed with five or six seconds, which would mean that there is fewer fusion events that you see there. This is a non-diabetic setting where you see a lot of fusion uh, events and there is a stimulation there with glucose, whereas in type twos, the, the, there, is, there is this disassociation of calcium channels. So there is fewer fusion events are insulin granules undergoing exocytosis in case of type 2 diabetes. To summarize this part, I would say calcium influx is synchronized to exocytosis. So the calcium influx happens through the calcium channels, and this calcium channels not being associated to granules 
uh, ensures that there is less of uh, exocytosis taking place of these prime variants. So there are a lot of proteins which are involved in this microdomain formation during docking and later during timing. So to name a few of them, I told you about some vaccine, a little bit of a story there, and I told you about calcium channels. But there are many more proteins as you can see there. I don't want you to overwhelm with information on, on all these proteins. Each one of them has a story, but I'm not going to say that now. But I would concentrate on EPAC2. Why EPAC2? EPAC2 is considered to be a novel diabetic treatment strategy, and that's why I would show more on EPAC2. I'm not showing data here on EPAC2, but EPAC2 is something that's recruited during granule priming. It's not recruited during docking, but much later during priming. What is interesting is that when you have uh, GLP-1 or GLP-1 analogs, which are used as anti-diabetic treatment, what happens is that these granules, which are not so associated with EPAC2, they suddenly start to associate very well with EPAC2. So this is what you see, an increased association of these granules with EPAC2 when you have these anti-diabetic drugs like GLP-1 analogs. And this happens even in the type 2 diabetic beta cells. You can see that the association improves when you add GLP-1 there, which is quite significant. But bear in mind that it is not same as a non-diabetic individual because there's a big difference between these two there. So try to, 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 to recapitulate this, we tried to build an EPAC2 knockout mice. And this EPAC2 knock, knockout mice surprisingly behaved like a mouse, which was diabetic. So there was blood glucose, which went up, but never came down. And this is, a, uh, this is a normal mouse where you can see the blood glucose goes down very fast. I'm telling you a lot about GLP-1 and GLP-1 analogs. Where does this GLP-1 come from? Come from? The GLP-1 comes from a proglucagon that is being synthesized. And this proglucagon is being converted by phosphoconvertase 1 and 3 in the gut. And that is where the GLP-1 and GLP-2 comes from. We don't focus on other parts of it. This is just to show you that this comes from the gut, but not the pancreas itself. So I told you about uh, insulin secretion and how the insulin secretion happens. So what we try to do with uh, having these GLP-1 analogs is that when you look at the fusion, you see many different fusion events. For each of these cells that we obtain from these non-diabetic or type 2 diabetic donors, what we try to do is we individually counted how many fusion events exist. So you usually individually go into the cell and say how many granules are there, how many fusion events do you see? It is a time-consuming process, but there are some automated softwares that help us. So these are fusion events that we count. When we counted them, what we saw was that in uh, when we when we uh, when we just have cells in a normal buffer, so there is uh, there is excitosis events that you see there, and there is an increase in the excitosis events when you stimulate the EPAC2, like I showed you in the previous slide. And there is even more increase if you use a GLP-1 analog, which is the highest increase that you can see there. And when you inhibit EPAC2, then there is a strong decrease of exocytosis. This increase, bear in mind, is higher than all the sulfonylurea. So currently, sulfonylurea drugs are widely used, like metformin, tolbutamide, glibentamide, glycoside, and all that. So this GLP-1 analogs has a much higher frequency of exocytosis than all these sulfonylureas, which, which have been studied and which have been administered. So it is really novel. So how does that, what is the mechanism of this? So the mechanism of this is when there is fusion, so there is an increase, uh, there, there, is a, there is a lifetime for fusion, there is a kinetics for fusion. The kinetics of fusion, where there is the uh, opening of the core, this is increased much further when, they, when you use uh, GLP-1 analogs. That is what is the mechanism of action at the level of individual cells, at the level of individual granules. So there are many different proteins that are involved in uh, diabetes. EPAC is only one of them. And we tried to see many different proteins. So we had access to almost 178 donors, which were diabetic and non-diabetic. So this is a busy slide. I would uh, try to focus on small parts of it just to show or appreciate that this study is really diverse with a lot of uh, potential markers which could be used for anti-diabetic treatment. For example, there are these proteins that you can see. So these are correlated with how much insulin secretion happened 
versus how much expression there is in these 178 donors. And you can see with some of them, they correlated very well, which means that if there is higher expression of these proteins, there is higher exocytosis that happens. Or you can also see that the, the HbA1c is a measure of how diabetic a person is. Higher HbA1c means the person is severely diabetic. So you can also see the correlation between higher HbA1c and lower expression of these proteins, some of these here. So there could be a scenario where you could target these individual proteins to cure diabetes. EPAC2 is just one of them. So many proteins localize at block granules and expression of these uh, proteins contribute to a docking complex or a microdomain which is formed and decrease of these protein expression uh, means that there is less docking and uh, which is characterized by type 2 diabetes. So these things can be taken into consideration for developing new anti-diabetic drugs. So with this, I would like to summarize by saying that looking at individual beta cells gives us a lot of insight. And this insight is in the direction of, uh, at the level of si single individual granules and what happens to them. And this will give us a lot of uh, ideas on what, what, what are the new anti-diabetic treatment strategies that you can uh, come up with. Uh, so looking at docking and priming is only one of them. There's much more to it, like this uh, insulin granules budding off from the Golgi, et cetera. At least from this study, what we know is that when there is no docking and priming in case of type 2 diabetes, so because there is no docking and priming, there is reduced exocytosis, which ensures that there is not much insulin available to metabolize glucose, and then people suffer from hypoglycemia in case of type 2 diabetes. So it's a very challenging task. So it involves multiple labs. Uh, and here we have an association called XDIAB. So each of the labs do one part of the research. A sale, a say a lab looks at a, a patient genotype, a lab looks at a patient phenotype, and someone else does gene expression, someone else does insulin processing, someone else metabolites, someone else uh, on calcium responses, single cell sequencing, and all that. So there are many different labs across India as well. And if these labs come together and form a network, that is, I think, the best way to solve or understand what happens in these individual uh, individual donors and individual beta cells of these donors and get a lot of knowledge to develop new tools or new anti-diabetic strategies to treat diabetes, I would think. So with this, I would like to acknowledge my PhD supervisor, my research group in Uppsala, and my uh, postdoc supervisor in Oxford, and then my current research group here in Gothenburg, and all the research grants that I've received, which helped me do all this. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you, uh, you I made you understand how important it is to study these. Exams. And uh, you can ask me questions so I can answer. It's not. Thank you, sir, for your informative and enlightening talk. I request Dr. Nandini to give an overview of the session. Thank you, sir. So to summarize the session, sir provided a clear subcellular view of diabetes milker. He started with statistics showing increase of diabetes mellitus in recent years in different countries. He highlighted the diabetes mellitus as a syndrome and not a disease. And it varies with individuals, the effects it shows on other organs in human system. He also showed us the mechanism of insulin secretion and how they are affected in type 2 diabetes mellitus. He drew our attention towards 
principle of total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy and is stressed with docking studies and GLP-1 origin. Summaries of the topic made the presentation more interesting. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil, for your inspiring presentation. Your years of research and depth of understanding has been revealed in an interesting way. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, participants can post any questions, uh, so speaker can answer those questions. Question mm. here. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, calcium supplements can it alter the insulin secretion along with any lipidemic substance if, if it is given in combination? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the calcium, uh, so there is a uh, potential treatment strategies that are also tried with uh, having the calcium channels open all the time. So so the, the, if you keep the calcium channels open, there's a trigger which is on all the time, which means there is more insulin secretion that happens. But what this does also is that the pool of granules which are present at the plasma membrane, they are depleted then. So the, the, the pool is not replaced at the same time. So it would probably at a short time do good, but on a long-term basis, it wouldn't do any good. I would think. Thank you again, sir, for a truly memorable presentation. And we hope you can join us again in such programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it was very nice to be present in this uh, webinar. Thanks a lot. We shall move on to the second session, wherein we have Dr. Devaraj Acharya from West Hertfordshire Hospital, NHS Trust, Watford from UK. I request Ms. Angelia Alford to introduce our guest. A very pleasant afternoon, everybody. It certainly is my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker of the session, Dr. Devaraj Acharya. On finishing his schooling at Pompeii Higher Secondary School and pre-universities at Pompeii Junior College, Mangalore, he completed his MBBS from Government Medical College, Mysore, and continued his MD degree in anesthesia at the same college. After becoming a lecturer in anesthesia for a year at JSS Medical College, Mysore, he attained training in cardiac anesthesia at Southern Railway Headquarters Hospital Perambur, Chennai. He served as a consultant in cardiac anesthesia 
and as an assistant professor in anesthesia at Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute, Porur in Chennai. After this, he left for the UK. He undertook further training and exams in the UK and obtained fellowship <coughs> of the Royal College of Anesthetists and the fellowship of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine in the UK. He has thus, since 2005, served as a consultant in anesthesia and ICU in West Hertfordshire hospitals of the NHS Trust at Watford in the UK. He possesses special interest in a few areas in his speciality, along with educational and managerial responsibilities within his organization. He also has to his credit publications, poster presentations, and oral presentations in regional, national, and international meetings. He is the founder of the charity Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, based in Mysore, while he is also the founder, president, and current trustee of the same charity in the UK. Being a keen reader and an ardent believer in lifelong learning, I must say that we are indeed privileged for you to share with us COVID-19 and the pandemic and beyond the experience of a UK frontline doctor. Over to you, doctor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just uh, trying to unlock the camera, sorry. Um, let's see. Just see what happens. Uh, access camera, microphone. Okay. Apologies for the technical glitch. I have, uh, I think, technical issues since morning. My internet wasn't working. <laughs> That's okay, sir. You can continue, sir. I just yeah, just give me a second. Oh, yes, just, uh, yes, sir. Okay. No. For some reason, it's not allowing me to use the camera. So just give me a second. Participants, we'll start the session after a few minutes. Yes. As so there is technical there. issues. Uh, share a slide uh, later. You can continue talking, sir. You sure? Okay, let me see whether I can do the presentation without. Uh... <laughs> Can you see the slides there at least? Okay. Can you see the slides? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir, you can okay. carry on, sir. Okay. So Thank you me. won't see me. That's, uh, that's in a way it is better. So <laughs> we'll see. Sorry about the technical glitch. Right. So uh, thank you, Angelis, for the nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for organizing such an excellent webinar 
and inviting me to this webinar. And my special thanks to my classmate and friend, Alphonse, for inviting me. I'm one of the consultants in anesthesia and intensive care unit working at uh, Watford General Hospital, which is nearly 20 miles up north of uh, uh, London. Now, it's a decent, it's a larger, one of the largest dis district general hospitals with a decent size of uh, intensive care unit with 20 intensive care beds. For the next 40, 45 minutes, my plan will be talk to talk about pandemic to start with, then talk about COVID-19 management in, in the intensive care setting, share some personal experience and talk about current situation of pandemic or COVID-19 in the UK, and maybe a glimpse of future. And I hope 10 to 15 minutes for discussion at the end. So, when I looked at the program, I'm an odd man out. Uh, I'm not a chemist. I'm not, I, you know, my experience in chemistry was when I was doing pre-university PUC and uh, experience with biochemistry during my first year of medicine. Uh, today's talk is mainly based on the evidence, current evidence and my personal experience. I have nothing to declare. I have no conflict of interest. I've not received any financial support. I must say, I'm not a world expert on COVID-19. However, I have reasonable experience in uh, treating severe COVID patients and also first-hand experience having COVID uh, and I suffered with COVID. So as we all know, the first cases were reported in December 2019 from the Wuhan province of China. I think that was the first case was on December 3rd. Though the cases were you know, happening in the month of November 2019 itself. Since then, cases have been reported virtually from every country in the world. On 30th of January 2020, World Health Organization declares a pandemic and public health emergency of international concern. The two reasons why the COVID-19 is creating such a havoc in the world, one is it's an emerging infection, it's a new disease, so most of us do not have any immunity. And also the virus is, uh, the spreadability of the virus, it can spread very easily. So on the 9th of February, 2020, uh, Tedros, the Director General of World Health Organization called this as COVID-19 disease caused by this novel coronavirus. The COVID stands for co, the beginning, two letters for corona, VI is for virus, D for disease, and 19 is uh, 19, standing for 2019, the year it was uh, uh, diagnosed, identified. By 9th of February, there were more than 42,000 confirmed cases of COVID uh, with more than 1,000 deaths in China. At that point, only less than 400 cases were described or identified worldwide, uh, only in 24 countries and one reported death, I think this was in the States. The taxonomist, the, ex, the experts, expert virologist who decide on the taxonomy of the viruses called this as SARS-CoV-2. This is because of the similarities to the uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, by this is the latest data from yesterday uh, the world health organization data on the left side which says there are 86 million confirmed cases globally with a death rate death of uh, death rate of 1.8 million globally on the right side what you see is the john hopkins university data yesterday they say there are 88 million confirmed cases globally with a uh, death of 1.9 million globally if you look at the league table of COVID-19, this is again data from yesterday. It's widely spread. USA, India, Brazil, Russia, and UK are the hardest hit countries with highest number of COVID cases. So you see the United States leads the table with nearly 300,000 death rate, 21 million cases. India has 10 million cases with a newly reported of 18,139, nearly 1.5 million deaths. 
UK is number five with uh, you know 2.8 million uh, cases and 77,346 deaths. Now this is again the latest data for UK, the United Kingdom. Uh, this is we get everyday bulletin, everyday news update about COVID, and yesterday 68,053 patients new diagnosis, and we had the highest death rate since the pandemic started with 1,325 people dying. Then the important thing here to look at is the percentage changes from the previous week. So we had a death rate change of 44.6% compared to last seven days. That is the worrying thing. If you look at the death rate, this is the UK data. Uh, the started keeping data from 1st of uh, March. If you look at the, the peak was around 9th of April uh, with a death rate of 1,116 patients. And the peak death rate was on 21st of April with 1,124 people dying. If you look, then the gradually there was decline. We are in the second peak, the second wave. We haven't peaked it, peaked yet. Uh, yesterday recorded the highest number of deaths since the start of uh, COVID in, in the UK with 1,325 patients dying. That is again the worry. If you look at the India, I'm quite happy. This is a good graph. I hope it stays like that. Uh, the first case was reported on the 5th of uh, March, 2020. Uh, peak cases were reported on 17th of September, 2020 with 97,894 cases. Death rate was, uh, I think, peaked on 16th of September with 1,290 uh, people dying. Uh, total deaths is 151K. So if you look at the you know 10.4 million cases recovered 10 million deaths of 151k. This is again data from uh, uh, World Health Organization from yesterday. So yesterday's new cases were 18,139 with the deaths of 234, which is pretty good. <clears throat> Coming to coronavirus, so the COVID-19 is produced by coronavirus. Uh, it is named coronavirus because of its uh, uh, characteristic appearance with the sphere with a lot of spikes around uh, looks like a crown. So that is why it is called corona. The spikes are made up of uh, uh, glycoprotein. You can see that with RNA inside and the envelope. Now, if you ask me, coronavirus is not new to humankind. There are more than 100 uh, coronaviruses described. They produce disease mainly in animals. The four coronaviruses which we are interested in because it affects human beings are the first one in 2003, uh, which produced SARS in China, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Second one is the uh, MERS, which is uh, uh, Middle East respiratory syndrome. And this was reported in 2014. Again, there is always these are these diseases will have uh, an animal vector. Uh, MERS was they transmitted from uh, camel to human. Luckily, there was the human to human transmission occurred in Mars only when the patients were very severely ill, admitted to intensive care unit. Luckily, they could contain the disease. Others, coronavirus is normal, which produce, uh, rarely in an event that produces uh, simple flu like symptoms. And the last one is COVID 19, uh, the SARS CoV 2. So what happens, the virus uses its spike, the glycoprotein spike, to bind with specific uh, receptors in human cells. The receptors are called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or AS2 receptors in human cells. Mainly the ciliated epithelium present in the upper respiratory tract, including windpipe. Once it attaches to the receptor, it can dissolve the cell membrane and enter the human cell and start triggering infection. It is a contagious disease, spreads very rapidly. It's also a zoonotic disease. The, what I mean is the, the disease can spread from, between animals, can spread from animal to human and human to human. However, for COVID-19, they haven't, though they, they claim that it originated from bats, they have not really identified the animal vector. And this is one of the reasons why World Health Organization was slow in declaring pandemic and because 
they were assured by Chinese that the disease was not transmissible between humans. Luckily for us, most people infected will have mild to moderate respiratory illness, and they recover without any requiring special treatment. This is around 80% of the patients, which is very good. Another 14-15% of patients will have severe illness. They need hospitalization, may need oxygen therapy. Another 4-5%, to 5 these are the patients which I'm interested in wherein my role comes in. They are the most serious patients who uh, get admitted to intensive care unit. These group of patients are mainly elderly with uh, multiple comorbidities, could be diabetic, hypertension, heart disease, cancer patients or severely obese patients. Now the spread of COVID spreads mainly through the droplets of saliva or discharge from the nose or your respiratory tract when you start coughing, sneezing, singing. Now it also can be transmitted through fomite. What it means is if you touch, if you're infected person and touch your mouth, nose, and then you touch the objects, the virus lasts there, and someone touching that can carry that forward. The nosocomial transmission is reported. This is this. What I mean is, when we treat the healthcare workers, when we treat these infected patients, then we are exposed to these droplets and uh, what is called as aerosols, and we are at risk to get this infection. And the we can the healthcare workers can transmit this disease from to our patients. This happens mainly due to lack of infection prevention control measures and uh, uh, personal protective equipment. The median incubation period is about five to six days. What I mean is once the virus gets in your body, for you to start your symptoms, it takes five to six days with a range of two to 14 days. The infection period is very unclear. However, we believe before it becomes symptomatic, 24 to 48 hours before you can be uh, transmitting the disease. During the early phase of the disease, large amount of virus levels are identified in the respiratory tract. So how can we prevent? A lot of things, these are social measures, what we call, by practicing respiratory etiquette, by coughing, you know, wearing a mask, by coughing into a flexed elbow. The best way to prevent and slow slow down transmission is if you know if one need to be well informed about the COVID-19 virus and you need to know how the disease know what it causes how it spreads and you have to protect yourself and others the worry is with the asymptomatic carriers what it means is you're not asymptomatic but you're carrying the virus the current new variant what is we discussed in, in a while in the UK 30% uh, of them are asymptomatic carriers. That is why the disease spreads so rapidly as well. During the first lockdown, we had the slogan from the government, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. As the number of cases decreased, we moved on to uh, hands, face, and space. Basically, sanitize your hands as often as you can, uh, wear a face mask, and uh, maintain a social distance of two meters outside. And we are back into stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives as we are in lockdown three now. <clears throat> so the NHS England gave us directive saying that the main symptoms of uh, COVID-19 is a persistent high temperature of more than 38 degrees, a new continuous cough, a loss or change to your sense of smell or taste. Most people with coronavirus have at least one of these symptoms. The less common symptoms are aches and pains, sore throat, diarrhea, uh, conjunctivitis, headache, loss of taste or smell, a rash on skin or discoloration of fingers or toes. Serious symptoms, uh, but when I say these serious symptoms, these, uh, these people need to be admitted to the hospital. They may need intensive care support. A difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath, chest pain or tightness, pressure, loss of speech or movement. Uh, we mainly ask for fever, cough, shortness of breath. Those are the symptoms we look at it. So this is what we feel working in the uh, front line. Uh, you are the front line person is doing all the work and you have so many other people, the bodies, gov governing bodies, everyone looking at you from distance and you're the one who is doing all the work. So 
beginning of pandemic was completely different from uh, as this disease is different from any other disease. Uh, this was the uncharted territory we were entering because none of us knew about COVID-19. Various guidelines and recommendations started flowing in and they, started, they, they were changing so fast in the beginning, March, April. Uh, to give an example, in our theater operation policy was changed 13 times since March 2020. It is still ongoing. Almost you know, once a week, twice a week, our operation policy changes. Any guideline or operation policy in the UK lasts for two to three years, so you can imagine that. The national organization, the Intensive Care Society itself, has changed its guidelines three times in three months. Uh, that shows the fluidic nature of the uh, situation here. Most of the guidelines say at the end, the disclaimers state that this guidance provides contemporary information. One has to look for current evidence. So what happened in the intensive care setting? So we were, you know, like we knew January, I think January, February, we knew uh, COVID is coming, COVID is in China. So everyone thought it's not going to come here so many thousands of miles away. And uh, I think in the month of February, we start, we got a jolt because uh, Italy started reporting. And I have a colleague of mine, uh, who is an Italian, and he was getting first-hand information from his colleagues. We came to know that patients were dying in intensive care unit. There were no beds, and they were ventilating patients in the corridors. Uh, the situation was dire. That's what gave us a jolt, and we started looking at uh, preparing ourselves for a major COVID pandemic. Also, the Department of Health made it clear uh, that wrote a letter to all the medical directors of uh, NHS Trust saying that uh, everyone should be prepared for a pandemic. To give a perspective, UK has total of 5,900 intensive care unit beds, uh, 4,100 adult and uh, uh, 1,800 uh, uh, pediatric beds. <clears throat> now, the Department of Health said in a worst scenario, each hospital should be able to provide four times their intensive care capacity. And within two weeks, we had to come out with a plan to provide twice the capacity. That means our intensive care size of 20 beds, we were uh, supposed to prepare for 20, 40 beds within two weeks and uh, to prepare for 80 critical care beds. It was a big ask. Now, so we, we have to make various changes to adapt ourselves. So it's not easy, you know, the, the various uh, stakeholders are involved in this. Uh, like you can, because intensive care is very highly specialized area. It's quite, I call it as expensive care unit because it costs us to run nearly 3000 pounds to look after one patient each day. So it is an expensive uh, business. Uh, it involves logistics. Uh, you know, you can say we'll have 40 beds, physical beds, but you need to have the location. You need pipeline, gas supply, suction, so many things. Staffing is very important, which is currently at short now. Uh, we need trained, dedicated intensive care nurses, porters, healthcare assistants. Some of them we could redeploy from theater and other areas. They need to be educated. Upskilling was a big task. We need we had to run you know training sessions very fairly quickly. Uh, ethics forms an integral part of intensive care unit. When I make a decision whether this patient is for intensive care treatment or not, when I decide to stop treating the patient or withdraw treatment, a lot of ethics is involved. Equipment is another important issue. Yes, you could buy, but every hospital in the country or across the globe were in the same situation. There is a huge demand for equipment. Each bed space needs a ventilator, monitor, kidney machine, large number of syringe drivers, infusion pumps, so name it, you need it. And we borrowed some and we mobilized some equipments from various other areas. We need large supply of medications. So suddenly you are doubling your capacity or four times, quadrupling your capacity. You need medications, medication to keep them asleep, as a relaxant, inotropes, so many things. Patient and relative management is an, it becomes an issue. So who's going to speak to the relatives? 
So what we did was we stopped all elective operations. The VR across two sides. So we stopped one side completely, moved all the equipment, moved all the staff. They were redeployed. We carried out only trauma patients, maternity, emergency, and cancer patients. Only those procedures carried out. Majority of the wards were converted into COVID wards. The respiratory consultants in the respiratory ward on the ward started what's called as non-invasive ventilation, so giving oxygen with a pressurized mask. We, we, came, we told our medical director we could immediately increase to 36 beds, and if we are pushed for maybe 40 beds, and various staff were redeployed. <clears throat> Other thing government did at this point was a good uh, partnership with private hospitals. They negotiated at the national level, NHS England negotiated a deal with the private sector so that every private hospital in the country was taken over by a nearby NHS hospital. We took over Spire Bushy Hospital. So all the cancer patients we did in that hospital. No elective private work was done between 1st of April and 1st of July. And we were supposed to restart our private work back to normal pre-COVID time on the 4th of January. We did start, and only yesterday I was told they may have to stop from next week because of the second wave. So it's very uncertain now where we stand. Looking after these patients with COVID-19 was a complete rethink about the workforce. So normally I would say one nurse will look after one sick, uh, critically ill patient. We have to, I think at the peak, we have, we have we had to go for one is to four nursing ratio. That means one nurse looking after four patients. We had to do a rota fairly quickly with efficiently, uh, including various other staff. New working patterns were devised and the we had to be very flexible because things were changing so fast. Number of cases patients admitting was high, staff were becoming sick. So th it was a very chaotic situation. There was that needed to be a calm and collaborative way of working by various divisional directors, clinical directors in redeploying and a good understanding. The bottom line was to keep the hospital running and to do the best for our patients. <clears throat> Patient management was a challenge, as I said, the sheer number of cases coming to the intensive care unit in a short span of time was scary. And uh, the other thing was the, I, I could say one day I was told within six hours, there were 100 COVID patients turning up in accident and emergency department. Intensive care always provides a supportive treatment. We can't do wonders in the unit. We can only support the organs as and when they need. We can't repair the damaged organs. Now, most of these COVID patients needed respiratory support. However, as the disease progressed, they ended up with multi-organ failure requiring heart, support the heart, kidney, all those things. And uh, the worrying thing was we saw young patients, quite young patients dying uh, due to cardiac event. And who the patients who survived were in for a long haul, long duration. And we just discharged the other day a patient who spent 83 days. And I currently have a patient who is 63rd day today in the intensive care unit. So coming to aerosol generation, as I mentioned earlier, we are, it's because it's highly contagious disease and the aerosols, all the secretions we deal with, uh, we are exposed to the risk of COVID. Most procedures we do in the unit are aerosol generating procedures, be it uh, putting someone to sleep, putting the tube down their throat, suctioning their throat, endotracheal tube, tracheostomy, everything is aerosol generating procedure. So we are at highest risk of receiving this, getting this disease. So use of full PP is mandatory, but it comes with its own uh, the drawbacks. PP for longer periods gives you physical and mental strain, restricts your task performance, it makes you work harder, Communic I found communication was very hard. You couldn't speak to uh, catch what other person is saying. You couldn't communicate to the patient. And more so if I was speaking to the patient's relatives over the phone with full PP, it was a nightmare. So the AGP risk and transmission was reflected uh, in that eight of us, including me, 
of 11 ICU consultants got COVID during the first pandemic. So that is me with the full PP entering into my side room, one of the ICU beds. Uh, this is me with the different uh, hood we call as PAPR in the operating theater. <clears throat> so what were the treatment options? We had, in the beginning, there was no definitive treatment. It was only supportive treatment. By mid-June, there was evidence for the use of antivirals, dexamethasone, and blood thinning medications. As I said, ethics is an integral part. There are, especially so during pandemic, because there are restricted services due to increased demand. The important issue is no patient should be denied of treatment due to lack of resource. So immediately the trust formed an ethics committee who would visit us every day, lunchtime, and we'll go through the difficult cases and make plans. They, I think this gave the reassurance to the trust board that we are doing the right thing. And also for us clinicians that we are in the right track. So the management varied like if uh, no patient would come to the hospital unless they run through the triple one telephone helpline. So they would advise, they will kind of triage the patient. Most of the patients were advised to stay at home, a self-isolation, supportive with fluids and paracetamol. And the severe cases were asked to come to hospital and they were tested, the various investigations, bloods, chest x-ray, CT scan. On admission, they'll they'll do the oxygen level, and if it's less than 92 percent, we'll treat, give supplemental oxygen, and then there is a COVID pathway we have to follow. When they are admitted, unless they are serious, uh, seriously ill, they'll be managed on the ward with oxygen, IV fluids, antibiotics, blood thinning medications, and non-invasive ventilation to support their breathing. Once they are admitted. It's very ill, critically ill. We will know every day we'll have the dashboard. We have a meeting in the morning, how many patients on the ward, who is not doing well. And we review those patients and if they're appropriate to come to ICU, we admit them. We may continue the non-invasive ventilation, continue their antibiotics and blood thinning medications. On top of that, if they don't do well on non-invasive, then we will start the ventilatory or breathing support, put them, put them on a breathing machine after inducing coma. And as and when they needed organ support, we moved on to multi-organ support. A prone ventilation, we tried pretty early on because that made some difference to these patients, wherein the patients, instead of lying on their back, will be lying on their front. We'll have some images soon. So these, these are the ventilatory <clears throat> non-invasive strategies. You have tight-fitting masks, different masks, and the hood, which fits around your head or mouth, and then you breathe through that with supplemental oxygen. It can be claustrophobic. This is high flow nasal oxygen. If, you, if somebody didn't do well with that, next option is to put them on the ventilator, breathing machine, and the tube, this tube goes into a windpipe once we put them to sleep, and they're on the breathing machine. If they are, so they've survived beyond 14 days, then we'll end up doing a tracheostomy, making a hole in the front of the throat, pass the tube there, put them, continue to ventilate them. This is a prone ventilation. When their oxygen requirement reaches 100%, their oxygen levels are low, the next option is this. And it's a humongous physical task wherein flipping someone from their back to front and front to back, we have to do every 12 hours. And imagine moving somebody who is 150 kilos plus, it is an arduous task. And despite this, if they didn't do well, then we refer them to what is called as ECMO extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, wherein take the blood out of your body, run through and pump into an oxygenator, which adds oxygen to your blood, removes the carbon dioxide and pumps the blood back to your system. So this way you can rest the lungs or you can rest both heart and lungs, depending on where the tube goes in and comes out. These are specialist units. There are only five adult ECMO centers and four pediatric centers across UK uh, with the 27 uh, ECMO beds. You can imagine the strain on the system. And during pandemic, I think they managed to increase the capacity to 90 beds. And there is strict criteria for referral and acceptance, and uh, it's still ongoing. Uh, just to show how the blood you know, comes out through the pump, centrifugal pump. This is oxygenator and pump it back. Imagine a patient you know, who needs to be transferred to the specialist centers after establishing ECMO with the PPE, it is, you know, it gives you a huge physical and mental strain. Another patient on ECMO.
So these are different types. I wouldn't go into detail. So my experience, so <clears throat> I think February, we were kind of, yeah, it, is, it will come here. I think uh, it hit us hard on the 4th of March. I was on a call that weekend. And we had two patients, Asians, both Indians, admitted to the ICU on Monday, Tuesday that week. Uh, I think we never suspected COVID in them because they're at that point, the uh, Department of Health guidelines were very strict. And we followed that. There was no suggestion that they traveled anywhere, Italy, China, nowhere. No one came to them. Uh, their presentation was very unusual, abdominal symptoms. And uh, the son got very you know, ill on Tuesday. He had to be put on the breathing machine. And within a few hours, we had to refer him to ECMO. And they took, came and took over to St. Thomas Hospital in London. Uh, on Friday, I was on call. By evening, they called us back saying that he's COVID positive. And then hell broke loose because we had to make you know, isolate all these patients, isolate the staff who were exposed to them because no one was wearing PP. So it was just the beginning. And unfortunately, father died. He was the fifth uh, recorded death of COVID death in our country. And son was on ECMO for six weeks. And I was told just last week he came off oxygen and he's just barely able to walk now. So the way we work in the uh, UK is each uh, the country is divided into various uh, critical care operation delivery networks. There are 20 of them. We are here east of uh, England, and this is London. We just in Watford is just there at the border there. Now, we were told during the first pandemic, east of England was the third worst hit region in the UK, and we were the worst hit hospitals in east of England. Out of 18 hospitals, we had the highest number of cases. And 30% of COVID patients were admitted to our ICU. Uh, at the peak of pandemic, I think April, mid-April, we had 34 COVID patients on the breathing machine. <clears throat> now, Trust did a few things during the COVID uh, pandemic, beginning of pandemic. They started using what is called as a coronavirus assessment pod. Uh, these were uh, units for designated patients who were suspected or had symptoms suggestive and they would come there, they'll get assessed, uh, swab test, blood test, and all those things. Now, from the COVID priority assessment port, we moved on to because the, as the numbers increased, we couldn't manage them. The swab test was difficult. So we moved on to tents in the large, you know, large tents in the car park area wherein patients will drive through, do the COVID swab test, and the advice was given here as well. There was a dedicated COVID hub wherein which now the, the, but the patients or the staff could call them and get their advice. This was, initially it wasn't of great help, but now I think it works very well. It advises you on testing, isolation, shielding, uh, redeployment. Also during the pandemic, we were, you know, emergency accommodation, if you're doing a long shift and you're tired, you can't drive, you can ask for accommodation. You'll be given a room to stay overnight. <clears throat> Other thing they did was the because it's contagious disease, hospitals across UK, no visitors were allowed in the hospital. So we had to form a family liaison team, uh, callback service, visitor helpline, and uh, trust bought nearly 250 iPads for video calling the relatives. Messaging service started, and in ICU, we had a dedicated ICU nurse calling the relatives twice a day. As I said, the, this is the Spire Bushy Hospital taken over by us, uh, Watford General, uh, carried out mainly cancer procedures during pandemic. We did more than 1,500 procedures there. Virtual hospital was run by a respiratory team, doctors, nurses, and uh, uh, admin staff. Uh, it was a virtual clinic, telephone clinic, and if required, they would video call on smartphones. I was called twice when I was ill. And they treated, they claimed, they uh, made sure that more than 1,500 patients' uh, admission was uh, avoided. And for this, one of the respiratory consultants got an MBE. We always had a lot of updates, so your inbox was always flooded with the COVID update. One thing I noticed was a lot of uh, act of kindness during this pandemic. There are a huge number of volunteers I saw in the hospital, the general public, large amount of food donated to us, the, uh, healthcare workers within the hospital. At the beginning, we were struggling to get PPE, supply was in short, and uh, 
a few people donated, a few people made masks for us, and some charities donated us the theater scrubs because we couldn't work in our street clothes. The important part, most of the staff agree with me, is the Watford Football Club Sanctuary. I'll come back to that in a few moments. And most of the staff worked beyond their hours on there was what is called as public clapping in support of work. So we are lucky in that Watford Football Club here is just close next door to the Watford General Hospital. You walk across the car park, you're there. And this is supported by the main patron is Sir Elton John. So what happened was from April 19th to May 29th, 2020, they opened the doors. No football match was happening. So they opened the doors for us, NHS staff from Watford General. They provided us with more than 40,000 free meals. And they provided us with on-call rooms and meeting rooms for us. And they did wash our scrubs and return to us. It was of great help. <clears throat> so unfortunately, I was ill by then. I, I didn't make use of the system, but it was apparently very good. And two of my colleagues there, lunch break, they walked across. They said it was good for de-stressing after hectic work. And it was away from work, but close to work. And they, they could maintain social distancing. Large number of volunteers, I think the trust sent out a plea for volunteers uh, through their volunteer hub. They required healthy volunteers between 18 to 69 years. They had to train them, make sure they could do their tasks safely, uh, mainly delivering messages to relatives, food distribution, because large amount of food was do donated. So that has to go to relevant areas and distribution of PPE. They did a tremendous job. Clap for carers and it just I think you must have heard of this. This was uh, down on this was a ritual uh, during pandemic. Every Thursday night, eight evening, eight o'clock, uh, between 26th of March, 28th of May, everyone in the street came out and clapped for us. I think it was a nice gesture. Many celebrities involved in that. This was the idea by one of the Dutch expatriate Anne Marie Plas started in the UK. <clears throat> All was not gloomy uh, for their work. Two of my colleagues were recognized. This is on the left is Tracy Carter, Chief of Nursing, and this is my respiratory consultant colleague who was award recognized and awarded MB by the Queen. We were also in the press for bad reasons. On the 4th of April, it was uh, breaking news that Watford General Hospital uh, had oxygen failure. I was in charge of IC and we had to uh, pack and transfer eight critically ill patients to neighboring intensive care unit. We lost few of our colleagues. Uh, I think sadly, eight of our colleagues died. The youngest was 23 year old healthcare worker at the oldest was a, a retired um, um, care of elderly medical consultant. I had my own bit as well. I had uh, working hard with doing day and night shifts in the hospital. I finished four long days on 7th and 8th of April. I was ill with high temperature lasting between 39 to 40 degrees, cough, loss of smell, taste, vomiting, everything. This lasted for 11 days. It was a gradual recovery. I was back at work after five weeks. I've never taken sick leave in my life, but this was a jolt. I still have some plantar fasciitis, but I'm back in the COVID ICU. <clears throat> Moving on to recent changes. On the 17th of December, our health secretary, Matt Hancock, declared in the parliament that we have a new mutant variant in the UK. Viral mutations are not new. In the month of May, they reported, it was published in BioArt, that uh, the, the current strain of G614G mutation. But the changes mainly occur in the spike. If you see, remember the image, the spikes of the protein, spike protein. The original version was G614 uh, in the China, and that mutated into D614. I think this is the current dominant uh, coronavirus in, across the globe. Uh, now, it produces high viral loads and is more infectious in humans than the Chinese original version. Then there are mutations in the UK. You all must have heard the flights to India are canceled from UK. I think they're starting from today. And now the Sheffield, there is a virology center which maintains the coronavirus data. <clears throat> so they said there are, they, they always closely monitored all changes to the structures of the virus. And University College of London identified nearly 198 recurring mutations. 
Now, as I said, it's not new. The flu, the H1N1, they mutated so fast that every year we take vaccine, but they are different strain based on what is uh, circulating in the uh, community. Now, the current mutant variant is highly contagious. It is 70% more infectious. They say mortality, morbidity are same, but I don't agree with that because we see a large number of patients dying now that do produce prolonged illness and symptoms may not be what I discussed earlier. They present with unusual symptoms. The implications are if they're mutant virus, then the vaccines currently in development uh, usually work on specific uh, spikes of the virus. So if they mutate, they may not work. Uh, at the moment, this is theoretical, but I was told the current both Pfizer and AstraZeneca uh, vaccines are effective against the uh, mutant y variant. So the, this UK new variant uh, is uh, named as uh, VUI 2020-01 by Public Health England, their specialist unit now tag. Uh, it was declared by, uh, it was first identified on, in September 2020 in Kent and London. Uh, based on this, uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson declared the lockdown 3 on 4th of January. And they, we, we, the, according to PHE, 60% of the UK COVID-19 now coronavirus disease is due to this new variant. There is also South African variant, and it differs significantly from the UK one. Both mutations are on receptor binding domain or RBV domain. But what they say is this variant may not be uh, responding to the current vaccines developed. The time will tell, we have to wait and see. So I said, we show, so, saw this graph earlier, but the current <clears throat> UK data shows the RR ratio, the reproducibility rate is 1.1 to 1.3. One in 50 in the UK are infected, one in 30 in London are infected with COVID. London is the current hotspot. Percentage change every week is worrying. So at the moment in the UK, more patients are in hospital in England than the first wave. So first wave is around 19,000. Yesterday, we had 23,557 patients. So the daily admissions are increasing. There is north and south divide. Current uh, pandemic, the more number of cases are admitted in south and the north of England. London is worst affected. I was told there are 800 new admissions a day in London, which amounts to a large DGH every day. You need a, every new hospital each day for their admissions. So the effect, because of this, yesterday, the mayor of uh, London, Sadiq Khan, declared, this was breaking news, saying that it's a major incident in London. So you see here, the highest cases are in London. Next is east of England. So he claimed yesterday that one in 20 Londoners is infected with COVID currently. He had to call in fire brigade to help ambulances because ambulances received double the call yesterday, nearly 9,000 calls a day, which is humans. I feel we are going backwards. After the first wave, we thought we were under control. The hospital dashboard is worrying. 70% beds are COVID. 640, more than 640 staff are either infected, isolating, or shielding. We are moving towards COVID rotor. Ambulances are queuing outside. We are moved to ICUs extended to three areas, no surge areas. I'll find out when I go in tomorrow. I see a lot of younger patients, they are a lot of black Asian and my ethnic minority group patients on the wards and the unit. So second outbreak, second pandemic, I see younger age group patients. Uh, they say initially milder, but I don't think it is milder. Uh, less number admitted to ICU, this was a month ago, but not now. Reduce mortality, I don't think, because the mortality is increasing. There is protracted ICU say, stay, and these patients don't do well on ECMO. Healthcare workers are tired, morale is low. They work without, tirelessly without any breaks now, no holidays. Physical exhaustion along with psychological trauma is affecting them. I thought there was light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, this is what I was thinking in November, December. Uh, because vaccine was going to be <clears throat> introduced in December. Uh, with herd immunity, we should be able to uh, contain the virus. A lot of genomic studies are going in to look into why some patients have severe COVID, especially BAME group. Uh, they are also looking at genetic study of viral mutations. New antivirals are in the pipeline. I think large number of vaccines are in the pipeline, nearly 30, I'm told. So people are working on uh, vaccines. So I have 
taken on taken you through the COVID pandemic to the current state till you have genomic today, studies are going in to look into why some it's the worst pandemic in our lifetime uh one that uh, as i said it's not any healthy flu in the, the world we are still struggling uh, hope works in brings an end to our misery size of uh, uh, you know, even Oron before COVID-19, there was quality After shortcoming this, in most of the, the healthcare UK. systems. He undertook NHS further training and exams in the UK. But we were underfunded for the last 10 and years in the name of, the Royal of College efficiency of savings. So and the uh, there was shortage of staff, of shortage of beds, intensive care medicine in the UK. The aim is to maintain the quality. Quality must remain a central focus when and why we recover from COVID-19. It's time to examine every healthcare system through a fresh lens. It is also time to build a healthcare system that consistently delivers safe, effective, and affordable care to everyone who needs it across the globe. I'm going to play a video. This I have edited from the Trust website after the first wave. There were uh, you know, lessons learned and what happened, and people were asked and they gave their feedback. Please listen to this. One word I can describe with it war zone. I see this a war zone. As an intensive care nurse, I would have a one critically ill patient, but now I had two critically ill patients, three critically ill patients, and I was overwhelmed with my own skills. I was thinking, what will happen at the end of the shift? Will one of them survive? Will one of them gonna make it until the end of my shift? That is the kind of emotion. That is the challenge that was uh, around us. Pre peak, you have a sense of got to know the family and for that time be it two days two weeks two months you they became part of your family you became part of theirs and you learn things about the patient their names their like their their favorite football team what they like to eat their favorite music all of these things and in the peak, just, 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 it, you just didn't know your patients because you were so focused on just trying to keep them alive. In ITU, I feel like we can do almost anything. Um, you know, we can keep you alive, even on the edge of life and death, we can keep you there. Most of the time, you know, there are things that we can do, there are machines we can use, there are medications that we use. None of it made a difference. I felt utterly helpless. It felt like we were battling for people's lives. What? So thank you for listening. So if you have any questions, burning questions, I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, yes, sir, we do have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, the first one goes by asking you what you think the reason could be for the second surge of the virus. Right, the two reasons. One is the mutant variant, and the second reason is uh, the, the people taking the guard off. Um, I think the Scientific Advisory Committee was recommending uh, the government to second lockdown in December. You need to know that we are in the middle of winter. January, February will be the worst winter period. Winter periods, we normally see 50 to 60,000 deaths in the UK due to H1N1, uh, the normal flu, flu deaths. But and on top of this COVID, so the mortality will go up. And always during winter time, we will have pressure on the beds. So. Two reasons, as I said, one was uh, the, we didn't lock down too early. And because Christmas is very, you know, big festival in the UK, it's like Diwali in India, everyone would like to uh, celebrate. Uh, I think government was in, my, my own observation is government was in two minds because they didn't have the courage to say, look, we'll be going uh, down the route of lockdown. Uh, we will not have you know, Christmas like ever. We will have to celebrate within our family or within the household. But that didn't happen. So the Christmas, we were open. 
and post christmas new year started despite the various tiers of uh, lockdown you know we were in tier 3 tier 4 uh, still people did break the law so i think that is where uh, we are seeing the surge and uh, of course the variant of uh, coronavirus okay sir the second question is um, asking you whether there are any internal organs affected post recovery of covid-19 with patients of moderate symptoms uh, <clears throat> it's very difficult to say because i know my own colleagues who had mild symptoms but with the long covid syndrome fatigability they are still breathless but on the other hand we have severely ill patients and with the steroids and everything they have recovered reasonably well so you cannot i cannot say someone with mild symptoms not to have any severe long term effect other thing is what we see nowadays is mainly the uh, the nervous system the fatigability and uh, these are still same if you are not intubated and ventilated in the intensive care unit you shouldn't have any long term effect you may have protracted illness but you should recover out of it that's what we say all right sir Thank you, sir, for the words of knowledge. I request Ms. Angelia Alford to summarize the se session. Uh, well, at the outset, I really must thank you, doctor, for your open and personal share of your experience during the pandemic and your opinion of how it would go on even beyond. Well, to summarizing your talk, beginning with the chronology of how it started, when it was officially declared as a pandemic mm -hmm. and how we lack immunity for it because of which it easily spreads. Uh, you briefed to us the statistics and the peaking trends of the hike in number of cases and deaths. Uh, you enlightened us about how surprisingly this is not the first time we have encountered the crown bearing coronavirus. Um, though it is relaxing to know that most of us do not require any special treatment uh, when affected, the window of the 5% of serious cases is definitely a concern. Um, it was certainly informative about how the virus spreads and details about its infection and incubation periods while stressing on the precautionary measures which need to be taken. Uh, you told us about the life in the ICU where preparations were made beforehand for the arriving pandemic by multiplying your intensive care unit facilities by four. It certainly must have been very difficult to narrow down treatment just to sections of, say, cancer, trauma, maternity cases, and emergency cases. Uh, regarding the treatment, though it began cluelessly, luckily antivirals and anticoagulants stepped in. However, management of it included home isolation with paracetamol and fluids while, on, while maintaining and checking of oxygen level when it was less than 92% required uh, serious attention. Uh, the steps and measures which were taken, such as the virtual hospital or the drive through for checking and testing of um, coronavirus, um, special isolated hospitals for emergency surgeries, and many more which were taken, definitely were active measures with an attempt to make life easier. Uh, well, I'm definitely sure that above everything, your calm and composed nature of tackling the issue with a view to do your best for your patients was what helped you all resume normality this month. However, hope is our only ammunition to the upcoming uncertainty. Thank you very much, doctor, for your informative talk. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Angela. Hi. Sorry about the camera, but uh, at least we did it. Thank you, madam. If we commit ourselves to the successful completion of the task, then we personify excellence. With this quote and a hope of committing and showing merit in the work we do, I would like to conclude the last session of the international webinar on pharmaceutical chemistry and intellectual property rights. A short uh, college documentary will be played now. Soon after that, we shall begin with the valedictory function. Thank you.
I request all the participants to fill the uh, feedback form and the link is provided in the group. Valedictory is not the end, but beginning of new endless story. With this, we shall move on to the valedictory function. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the valedictory function of the three-day international webinar on pharmaceutical chemistry and intellectual property rights. We have with us Professor Balakrishna Kalluraya, Department of Chemistry from Mangalore University as our guest for the valedictory function. Now, I call upon Professor Brito Dominic Ryan, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, to introduce our guest. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to say a few words about Dr. Balakrishna Kaluraya, PhD, FRSC from London. Dr. Balakrishna Kaluraya got his PhD awarded in the year 1988 and has guided nearly around 35 students to get their PhD and currently to have submitted and five are working under him. Doctor has guided around six people for MPhil and has 384 publications to his credit. Doctor Balakrishna Kaluraya has a number of awards to be proud of. I'm mentioning a few. He got his Best Teacher Award from Mangalore University in the year 2015. Got the award of yeah. Professor S.P. Hairmatawa by the Indian Council of Chemists for the year 2015. UGC BSR one-time award of rupees 7 lakhs for guiding more than 15 students in 2010. Elected as fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, London, FRSC in 2018. Best oral presentation in the Kannada Vijnana Samelana held at Agricultural University, Darwad during 2012 on the topics, said knowns. And doctor has a number of foreign visits to its credit. It starts with countries like Malaysia, Singapore, UAE, France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Belgium, Netherlands, Russia, Indonesia, etc. Where he was invited to give a number of talks and uh, give the plenary lecture and he has projects worth rupees 1.6 crores from UGC, BRNS, CSIR, DST, etc. He has held a number of positions, naming a few, BOS, BOE, Department Chairman, etc. Welcome you Dr. Balakrishna Kaluraya for the valedictory section. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Good evening to one and all. Am I audible? Yeah? Sir, it's not audible, sir. Not audible. Hello? Is it audible now? Sir, we are not able to hear. Could you please unmute it, sir? Hello, now is it uh, audible? 
ஹலோ 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 இஸ் இட் அடிபிள் நவ் ஹலோ sir you can start sir hello hello so i'll open and see this ha huh? i can listen to them but uh, i don't think there is some problem i think okay hello okay mm -hmm. data comment ko nahi milta anda ha hello sir please proceed sir thank you sir audible sir so good evening to one and all on the occasion of the 3 day webinar on pharmaceutical chemistry and intellectual property rights pcir organized by the department of chemistry st philomena's college autonomous mysore i am very happy to share few of my thoughts on this occasion due to the corona virus corona pandemic our concept of seminars have been changed to webinars of course this concept of webinar was also there earlier but we are not familiar with that one although it has certain limitations like uh, personal interactions and uh, one to one interactions particularly are not possible during this uh, webinar it has got its own advantages like we can invite people from various fields from uh, all over the world and we can share their thought provoking knowledge with our new people who are attending the webinars i am sure that in the last 3 uh, days the various sections were very interesting and you have enjoyed it it was started with the uh, keynote address by professor mahadevan followed by the lecture on chemistry of fluorine by dr shridhar bhat then the relevance of ipr in pharma industry by dr bindu sharma intellectual property rights and patents by dr shrinivasulu recent advances in target based drug development for cancer therapy by dr basappa and in today we have two sections one is cellular views on diabetes and mode of action by dr nikhil and there afterwards covid 19 pandemic and beyond experience of frontline uk doctors by dr devaraj acharya i was completely attending these two sections and the previous two sections i viewed through the uh, this one that is uh, youtube and i today of devaraj acharya has given a very useful and thought provoking lectures and it was very interesting and even dr nikhil also has given a very wonderful lecture all the lectures i hope were very interesting and what thought provoking and it has really increased your knowledge to a higher level the knowledge of all participants and you have enjoyed it and i believe you have got new ideas in the relevant field today we are in the situation where we are not uh, able to meet our students or 
our schools are not yet opened, properly opened. And that is where we are going for these online classes and webinars and other systems, various other systems. However, this pandemic, COVID-19 has disturbed all of us to a large extent and made us life very miserable and also brought a lot of uh, difficulties in the finance sector. But with all that, that has also taught us some very interesting and uh, educative lessons in our life. So here afterwards, our teaching and the learning methods will be completely different from what we used to do before the COVID-19. You know, recently, the government of India has introduced a new education policy. And this was uh, brought after a very long time gap of nearly 25 years. And in this new education policy, which is somewhat very similar to the one which is followed by America and some other European countries. We have to adopt that one in the next years to come. However, in adopting and following this new education policy, the main role is involved in the people who are implementing it. Policies may come or may go, but how it is implemented, that will become very important. And what type of people are involved in the implementation of this policy, that is very important. Our policy change alone is not sufficient to bring about the dramatic uh, changes. It is how it is implemented and what type of people are involved in that uh, changes that is more important. Now, if you look into this country's education, we have seen from the beginning the role of the private institutions or private sector is very important. That may be Philomena College or any other institutions. They have played a major role in the contribution of education in this country. And many schools and colleges were started in areas where basic amenities are not available. And many of these private sector educational institutions have become the model institutions for others. Now, in the implementation of the new education policy also, I believe the role of private institution is very vital in that one. People are looking at towards the private sector for quality education in this country. I may say that many of the government institutions are also doing quite well, but due to the various factors, you know, now the people are looking towards the private sectors. So in the implementation of the new education policy, the role of private management and private colleges, whether it is a private university, private college, deemed university or anything of that type is very crucial and they will be the key players i believe in the years to come our system of education will drastically change in the next few years in this change our modern communication systems particularly the techniques will play a major role the present teachers should also get ready with to acquaintance with these changes and they should adopt the changes which is going to happen. In institutions should also set up smart classrooms equipped with the modern facility and the concept of sharing knowledge becomes a phenomena in the worldwide. Our examination pattern may also change in the years to come. The students can take some courses offered by international reputed 
institutions or universities by admitting to the local institutions or colleges or universities in our area only and these type of changes will happen in the next years to come the conventional classroom teaching may take a somewhat lose its importance i may not say that it will become obsolete but it will definitely going to lose its importance and the concept of webinars sharing of knowledges high through these uh, internet this type of communications using uh, modern technology will become more and more relevant just few days back i was looking into a Um, WhatsApp message which says that which gives some of the important uh, drastic changes that may happen in the in our country in the next 10 to 15 years it says that the future there will not be any petrol cars or vehicles run by petrol or diesel instead we have the electric cars coal mining industry will uh, sink artificial intelligence become a very prominent computers will become more powerful and more accurate in predicting all aspects of life so that we have some apps to find out what disease you have like your uh, retina if there are some problems it will be identified by the these apps and then similarly your uh, blood sugars everything will be monitored by these apps and you will be given signals warning signals frequently so that they will also give you the suggestions as to how to overcome this one what types of exercise you have to do what type of medicine you have to take and all these things will come in the next future so there may be decreased demand for doctors except for surgical operations similarly apps will be developed to look after the criminal or and civil cases so that uh, people will approve the apps and get their suggestions before going to the lawyers so the demand for lawyers may be also decreased there will be self drive cars so in future people may not go for own car yeah you have to go through the app and uh, order the car will come to your place and it will take you to the destiny where it is needed and you can return in the same one and solar power will production will dominate etc these are some of the messages that came in a predict whatsapp message which they predict in the next 10 to 50 years people may laugh that this is all a dream but 25 years back i was a child if i then if somebody was talking about a tv or smartphones people used to say it is a fool the same but it is a reality today so the situation is like that in the next 10 to 15 years nowadays you know that the system or the development is much faster than it was in 10 to 15 years so all these things will come into reality maybe much faster than what is predicted much earlier years than what it is predicted so today there is a big role for the teachers and the school management and they have to get ready with the, all these to face all these challenges and the modern development that is going to happen so here afterwards i believe the education system will going to change dramatically and we the teachers should ready to get acquainted with the such changes and we should increase our skill to make familiar or to get familiar with the modern 
technologies. Otherwise, we will become obsolete. Just two years back, if somebody was talking about the concept of webinar, nobody was, of course, it was earlier also, it was there. For India, it was not very familiar for us. We are always depending upon seminars or conferences wherein we meet with each other and like that. Now, we are very familiar with the webinars and also, you know, the limitations and the advantages. If you are thirst of knowledge, webinar gives you a lot of things. If you are only interested in certificate, that is entirely different, something like that. So I think this three days webinar organized by the Department of Chemistry Science Philomena's College is a very thought-provoking and interesting and has made the teachers or the students who have participated in the seminar to think and to come out with the new ideas. I wish and thank all the participants and the authorities who arranged this webinar and for giving me an opportunity to share certain of my thoughts on this occasion. I hope this webinar was very interesting for the participants. I wish and thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable words. With the quote by Dalai Lama, the roots of all goodness lie in the soil of appreciation. I think we now have a very unique opportunity to thank each and everyone who has directly and indirectly contributed for the successful completion of this webinar. I now request Professor Agnes Sylvia de Souza, Associate Professor Academic Coordinator for Science, Department of Chemistry, to render the vote of thanks. A very good evening to you all. It is said, the essence. A very good evening to you all. It is said, the essence of all beautiful art is gratitude. Hence, it gives me immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks. First of all, this evening, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Balakrishna Kalluraya, the professor and DOIS in chemistry, Mangaluru University, who kindly obliged and delivered the valedictory address. On behalf of management, staff and students of St. Phenomena's College, I extend a heartfelt thanks to you, sir. I would like to thank Monsignor Leslie Morris, the Episcopal Vicar, for having delivered the inaugural address, and Professor K. M. Mahadevan, former Register of Evaluation, University of Mysore, for his keynote address. My heartfelt thanks to our rector, Reverend Dr. Prakash Banis, Vice Rector, Father Maria Xavier, and Campus Administrator, Reverend Father John Paul, for their support in all activities. Our beloved principal, Dr. Ruth Shantakumari, who is a great motivator and an inspiration in all our academic endeavors. My sincere thanks to you, ma'am. At the same time, I extend my thanks to Vice Principal, the IQAC Coordinator, and PG Director. We express our thanks to Mr. S.R. Satisha, the Managing Director of Vishweshwaraya Trade Promotion Center, Government of Karnataka, Bengaluru, for collaborating with this seminar, webinar, in Philomena's College. I extend my gratitude to Madam Prabhavati Rao, IP Initiative, 
for her co for coordinating with us and briefing us on the intellectual properties. On behalf of organizing committee, I am thankful to Dr. Vinay Raghavendra, Department of Biotechnology, Theresian College, Mysore, who is instrumental in establishing a collaboration with VTPC Bengaluru. And also thankful to Dr. S. Srinivas, Department of Chemistry, Tumkur University, for helping us in arranging the resource persons. This webinar had six technical sessions where eminent scientists delivered the excellent talks. And they are Dr. Sridhar Bhatke, Srimati Bindu Sharma, Professor Srinivasulo Yanes, Dr. Basapa Yes, Dr. Nikhil Arji, and Dr. Devaraj Acharya. On behalf of organizing committee, management, and staff of the college, I thank you all. A big thanks to all the participants of the webinar, staff, students, and others who joined us through Google Meet or YouTube. The webinar of this kind involves a lot of technical work. I sincerely thank Dr. Sunil Disoza and Sandesh Disoza, both assistant professors of Department of Commerce, for beautifully designing the brochure and e-certificate. Thank you very much, sir. You have been a great help. I also thank Mr. John and Mr. Swaminathan for their continuous technical support during these three days. Lastly, I take this opportunity to thank all our departmental colleagues, Mr. Uh, Dr. Alfonso de Souza, Mr. Brito, Dr. Ravi Saldana, and especially Mrs. Bindu Narona, Ms. Archa, uh, Archana Mendonsa, and Dr. Shaila for anchoring the program. They have really worked hard for the success of this webinar. I also thank Ms. Angelia, who summarized, the, introduced our resource persons today and summarized the session. Once again, thank you. Thank you, one and all. Have a great weekend. Thank you, madam. I request all the participants to turn on your camera so that we can take a screenshot. Participants, please turn on your cameras so that we can take a screenshot Thank you. Now, national anthem will be played. I kindly request all the participants to pay respect.